Thanks so much for having me. I want to give a special thanks to my friend Deirdre and Janice Faraday, the great niece of Dr. Dorothy Faraday, for coming out to support me. This is a talk of my baby book, Twice as Hard, the stories of black women who fought to position from the Civil War to the 21st century. The research for my book began in 2018. After being awarded a Rhodes Scholarship, I moved to the UK to complete a master's in history of science, medicine, and technology. My plan was to complete my dissertation on the social and structural barriers put in place to prevent Black women from entering medicine. Up to that point, I had many encounters with prejudice in the science and medical communities. Either I or another student of color was the target of this maltreatment. I wanted to understand why micro and macroaggressions permeated these communities. There is limited literature looking at the experience of physicians who are both Black and a woman, so it seemed like studying the unique barriers of physicians with these intersecting identities would be a worthwhile project for me to pursue. But as I dug deeper into this research, the focus on my project began to shift. I was sitting in my cramped dorm room in Oxford, listening to a voice resonating through my laptop. It transported me to the other side of the world, back home. It said, after I got a taste of this thing of college, then I had to have more insane. Now my only fear there was that I cannot possibly make enough money with my mother to go into the next year. So I decided to make as much of that year as I could so that I could at least say that I had two years of college or three years of college. The sound of Dr. May Chen's voice seemed so familiar. It felt as though she was one of my great grandmothers. Dr. Chen and I were born 100 years apart and she passed away 40 years ago. Still, her voice bent through time and touched my soul. I could imagine us sitting on a pillowy couch in a cozy living room, both sipping a hot cup of English breakfast tea as she told me her life story. She bravely hurtled over the challenges of being a black woman entering the unwelcoming field of medicine in the early 20th century. And she came out on the other side in triumph as a skilled physician who made a huge impact in a patient's lives. Mei Chen was born in 1896 in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Neither her mother, Lulu Ann, nor her father, William Lafayette Chen, had a college education. They represented the vast majority of African Americans at the time who were not allowed to attain an education. May's father had been born into slavery. He seized his freedom at 11 years old when he bravely ran away from the Chen Plantation in Virginia. He never spoke about his painful experiences as a slave, but he focused on a pride he felt from outwitting his captors with his escape. May's mother, Lulu, was born in 1876, 13 years after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. So she never had to endure life as a slave, but she did work as a servant for a white family who moved from Virginia to Massachusetts. Lulu was determined to lead her daughter down a different path. She believed that a strong education would give May an easier life. But the Plessy versus Ferguson Supreme Court case was decided a month after May was born. The ruling codified racial segregation laws in numerous societal institutions, including the education system. This left May to be taught at schools that were deprived of educational resources and adequate government funding. Despite these challenges, Lulu did what she could to support her child. Her encouragement led May to get her undergraduate degree from Teachers College at Columbia University and her medical degree from NYU School of Medicine as the school's first black female graduate. Dr. Chen may not have known about other black women physicians during her training, since there were so few throughout the US. In 1900, there were only 160 black female physicians. Mm -hmm. This compares to 88,000 white male physicians, 3,500 white female physicians, and 1,600 black male physicians. Black women generally weren't welcome within the medical community, making Dr. Min Chen's training that much more difficult. After clearing one hurdle, Dr. Chen immediately faced another. Following graduation, she experienced intense racial discrimination. Residency programs refused to admit her. Hospitals refused to hire her. Sadly, the vast majority of Black physicians at the time faced this form of discrimination. But Dr. Chen was not deterred. 
To further her medical training, she worked for a group of male physicians in New York City. These white physicians also looked down on her and wouldn't even acknowledge her in public. Despite the isolation she likely felt in this practice, she remained there for multiple years to further her training. Then she opened her own practice, and for many years she was the only black woman physician practicing in Harlem, where she focused on serving black patients who refused care from hospitals due to racial segregation. Some of these patients needed surgery. In these situations, from Howard University College of Medicine. Dr. Chen described her medical practice as reminiscent of practices 100 years before. When these two African-American doctors entered a patient's home, they carefully surveyed the space. They needed to figure out how they were going to adapt the area for an antiseptic surgery. Depending on the size of the patient, they designate a bed or an ironing board as their operating table. Then, the doctors would wrap up their surgical dressings in newspaper and bake them in the patient's coal stove. In less time than it took to bake a loaf of bread, the dressings were sterilized and relatively safe to use. While the dressings were undergoing this process, the doctors went to another part of the patient's home, the washroom. Here, they used the patient's wash boiler, which usually washed clothes, in order to disinfect their surgical instruments. With everything set up, Dr. Chen would administer the anesthesia. Once the patient was induced, Dr. Murray would start the surgery. Throughout the procedure, the patient's grandmother, another family member, served as the nurse. Once the surgery was done, the two doctors took turns watching over the patient. They were both on call until the patient was able to get up. With some help and a heap of innovation, these doctors were accomplishing the remarkable feat of providing care for patients who have been discarded by the medical system. As someone who spent three months in the operating room while in my surgery clerkship rotation, I find the story awe-inspiring. Racism and sexism woven in the fabric of our society led members of the medical community to try to deprive Dr. Mei Chen of proper medical training. Then, they turned their backs on countless black patients who would die without medical care. But Dr. Chen persevered through these harsh conditions and used ingenuity to provide medical care for patients in need. Creativity and persistence were traits that many of the black women in my book shared. Another physician who employed these skills in order to overcome barriers erected in her path and to provide care for patients in need was Dr. Dorothy Farabee. Dorothy was born in Norfolk, Virginia, in 1898, two years after Mei Chen. Dorothy developed an interest in medicine at a young age. Her amb ambitions likely played a role in her parents' decision to move Dorothy to Boston and live with her great aunt, Emma Ruffin. At the time, the intense discrimination in the Jim Crow South stifled many black girls from achieving their dreams. While northern states like Massachusetts have their own problems, they offer m many more opportunities for African Americans. By the time Dorothy moved to Boston, more than 100 black women had trained in northern medical schools, while none had been allowed to study at southern medical schools outside of Meharry Medical College, a historically black medical school. Privilege counter prejudice, giving Dorothy access to opportunities that many black children in our generation didn't have. Without the opportunity to leave the South, another promising and ambitious black girl born at the same time in the same city likely wouldn't have become a physician. Thankfully, this wasn't the case for Dorothy. She started school at Tufts University School of Medicine in the fall of 1920. In Dorothy's medical class of 143, only five students were women, and she was the only black woman. While Dorothy and her white female classmates had different ethnic and socioeconomic backgrounds, they found solace in one another as they navigated sexism at an overwhelmingly male medical school. Throughout their training, the women often felt neglected by their medical professors. Whether in a large auditorium with all their classmates or in a small learning group, the women were consistently passed over when opportunities for individual learning arose. This gender-based exclusion persisted in the clinics. 
the women were relegated to clinical experiences that align more with the nursing curriculum, such as the bandage clinic or the foot soaking clinic. In comparison, the male students had extensive exposure to clinics more applicable to physicians, such as surgery and internal medicine. Despite these obstacles, the women refused to allow bigotry to impede on their dreams. In a 1979 interview, Dorothy reflected on how they persisted in those times. The five of us decided that we would stick together and we would study together and we would outrun some of the difficulties surrounding us. The women met every weekend to discuss cases from various foreign medical journals, including those from Paris, Berlin, and England. They would explain the different clinical cases and the physician's therapeutic approaches. By sampling such a large array of cases, the women felt more prepared for the hospital. At the end of medical school, all five women graduated with honors and were ranked among the top nine in their class. Dorothy was ranked number one. Despite being at the top of her class, Dorothy struggled to find a residency program that would admit her. She submitted her residency applications at the same time as her male counterparts, but they heard back months before her. When she finally received responses from, from residency programs, they said their spots were filled or that they weren't accepting women that year. One residency program even told Dorothy that her academic record wasn't strong enough for their program. But what academic record could be stronger than being the highest scoring student in your entire class? The white female medical students faced similar challenges, but they used their family connections and wealth to eventually gain admission into a residency program. At the end of her final year in medical school, Dorothy scrambled to find a residency spot. Her family didn't have the same resources as her classmates, but they did what they could. Her brother suggested that she look for a job in DC. This eventually led her to Howard University's Freeman Hospital, where she began her medical training in the summer of 1924. Dr. Farabee was a strong advocate for her community throughout her medical career. One of her most impactful projects was created in the 1930s in response to the Great Depression. The economic downturn devastated many communities in America, particularly the most vulnerable. Dr. Farabee knew that many African Americans throughout the country were hit hard, and she wanted to do something to help them. Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority became her avenue for having an impact. Founded in 1908, this is the first sorority for black college-educated women. Dorothy became a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha while she was an undergraduate student. I also had the privilege of joining this organization when I was an undergrad, along with my line sister, Jasmine, who's also in the crowd. <laughs> Service has always been a central tenet of Alpha Kappa Alpha. We implement community outreach projects on the local, national, and international levels. Dr. Farabee led one of these projects, Alpha Kappa Alpha's Mississippi Health Project. She served as the program director from 1935 to 1941. The program focused on Bolivar community, a predominantly African-American community that was struggling during great, the Great Depression. Like numerous other black communities in the Jim Crow South, the people of the Bolivar community suffered dismal health facilities. A significant portion of Bolivar's black men suffered from syphilis. This is one reason why the U.S. Public Health Service selected Bolivar County, in addition to five other rural counties in the South, for the infamous Tuskegee experiment from 1932 to 1972. Some of the same black men who were forced to live with untreated syphilis for decades may have also been Dr. Farabee's patients. Residents from Bolivar County also frequently died from tuberculosis. Starting the summer of 1935, Dr. Farabee drove to Mississippi with a team of black female doctors, nurses, and teachers, many of whom were likely members of the sorority. Once the women arrived, the f they faced hostility from the white plantation owners. These men didn't like the idea of black women coming to their area to provide medical care but they begrudgingly allowed the women to open clinics. 
Dr. Fairby and her team set up five clinics around the county. They had their medical instruments and medications ready to care for the community. On the day they opened, the clinics were eerily empty. They had notified the community members, but no one came. After further investigation, the woman found out that many people wanted to come, but the plantation owners would not let the black sharecroppers take a break from picking cotton in order to tend to their health. Unwilling to give up, the woman declared, well, if they can't come to us, we'll go to them. This is how the first mobile health clinic in the U.S. was born. These black women went to each plantation, carrying their medical supplies in their cars. Like numerous black physicians before them, these women were committed to serving a people who health, whose health was generally ignored by American society. Alpha Kappa Alpha's Mississippi Health Project provided immunizations against diphtheria and smallpox to more than 14,000 children. It also treated thousands of adults for diseases that plagued the Bolivar community, such as malaria. Dr. Farabee's contributions to the health project garnered her support within the sorority, and in 1939, she became the 10th international president of Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. The widespread impact that she had in the community caught the eye of Dr. Mordecai Wyatt Johnson, the first African-American president of Howard University. He took her on as a mentee and encouraged her to strive for more. With his support and encouragement, Dr. Faraby was named medical director of Howard University Health Services in 1949. This was noteworthy because it was almost unheard of for a woman to hold a high-level leadership position over men. Even at Howard University, a school that worked against racism, Dr. Faraby saw sexism persist. Many of the male physicians and directors at Howard resent, resented Dr. Faraby for her appointment as medical director. It's likely that she experienced further ostracization when the health division of the State Department selected her as U.S. representative for various global initiatives. It sponsored her for numerous medical service trips in Africa, Asia, and Europe. While engaged in these global initiatives, Dr. Farabee continued to expand her impact on the national stage. From 1949 to 1953, she was the president of the National Co Council of Negro Women. In 1950, she was appointed to the Executive Committee for the White House Conference on Children and Youth. In the 1960s, Dr. Farabee was appointed to President Kennedy's American Food for Peace Council. She even spoke before the World Health Assembly in Geneva, Switzerland. Throughout all of this, she continued to build Howard's Health Service, first as his medical director, then as a medical associate to the Dean of the College of Medicine at Howard University. In 1972, she retired from her private practice and her post at Howard. Like Dr. Chen, Dr. Farabee entered the medical field at a time with multiple structural barriers have been put in place to limit the number of black women in the profession. She prevailed in these hostile conditions by relying on a determination and grit, as well as the support of her family and a small group of peers and advisors who saw past her race and gender. Once Dr. Farabee secured her position within medicine, she turned her focus to serving the communities in need. Her involvement in Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority helped her find other black women in medicine, many of them sharing her commitment to giving back. She worked with the sorority and multiple other service organizations to care for the underserved. Through her efforts, she positively impacted hundreds of thousands of lives and had a global outreach. Dr. Chen and Dr. Faraby are two of nine black women physicians highlighted in my book. Their experiences span the more than 150 years of black women physicians practicing in America. The women in my book are only a small sampling of the immense cohort of black women physicians who've made a significant impact in the medical community. As we celebrate Women's History Month, I think about these incredible black women physicians and feel so grateful that they paved this path for me. 
With my book, I'm not just constructing a history. I set out to inspire future generations of black women and other minorities who pursue medicine, creating a new class of role models in the women whose histories I share. As Twice as Hard shows, Overcoming racism and sexism to become doctors was a monumental feat in and of itself. But beyond this, the physicians in this book made significant contributions to medicine and healthcare. And this new work establishes a lineage of black women doctors whose accomplishments are undeniably important and inspirational. Black women physician stories have gone untold for far too long, leaving gaping holes in American history and black history. And twice as hard, I'll set the record straight. Thank you. Any questions? So good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Jasmine. It's so wonderful to see you here. My name is Janice Farabee. As a fellow author, also a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, and a black female who spent her freshman year at Johns Hopkins because I wanted to be a cardiac surgeon, but went mm -hmm. on 20 years later to get my master's from, of social work from the University of Pennsylvania. And as the great niece of Dr. Dorothy Bolding Farabee, also the ninth president of Zy Omega mm -hmm. Chapter, the largest and first DC chapter here, Tell me, you know, even though your book is going to be lifting up black and brown and red and yellow young women to go into medicine, we know that there are only 6% of physicians across the country are black. Why is the number of black women and other women of color still so low going into medicine? What do you think? There are a lot of factors. One of the most definitive factors that I saw in my research was the closing of so many Black medical schools. Mm -hmm. So in 1910, there's something called the Flexion Court, mm -hmm. where this teacher who was like had some affiliation with the medical system did a survey of all the medical schools in the U.S. and he then creates this report, one, advising changes to medical education that have laid the groundwork for how medicine is taught today, integrating more biomedicine into the community. But he also recommended the closing of every Black medical school, except for Howard and Meharry. He, in his report, said that Black physicians should only be cheap to caring for Black patients and the fewer black physicians, the better. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like, oh, these schools are not up to par. He just had a racist agenda or a racist bias that then had a significant impact. At that point, there may be nine black medical schools, so those other seven closed. In 1910, when that report um, was published, 2.5% of all physicians were Black. Then in 2006, almost 100 years later, 2.2% of all physicians were Black. Prior to the closing of those Black medical schools, there was a continuous rise in a number of Black people entering medicine. Mm -hmm. And still today, now there's also Morehouse uh, Medical School, as well as Charles Street Medical School. And those four medical schools still train the majority of all Black physicians, despite there being over 100 medical schools throughout the country. Mm -hmm. So I think that is one huge factor, that we need to value our Black medical schools, invest in the ones that exist, and invest in creating more. I think that there are also challenges. So one thing that, for most of the history, there were more Black men in medicine than there were Black women. But then in the 1970s, that demographic switch, there were more Black women in medicine, entering medicine than Black men. And at that time, this was around a time of affirmative action. Every other minority group 
and white women increased significantly after affirmative action. But black men were the only group that they basically stayed stagnant in terms of their entry into medicine. This was also the time of mass incarceration, war on drugs, the preschool to prison pipeline. And so seeing that, how these huge factors in society were happening at the same time, my hypothesis is that that targeting, disproportionately targeting Black men, had a significant impact on the number of Black men that entered, went on to enter medicine. And so that shows to me how important things that happen at a young age go on to impact who's entering medicine. A lot of women in the book talked about um, how they had advisors, counselors even in high school, telling them that they couldn't become physicians because they were Black, women, poor. Um, and that's something that still happens today. When I was when I was a kid, as young as elementary school, I had classmates telling me that because I'm Black, I'm not smart and I won't succeed. And so when you're getting these messages as a kid, unless you have a strong support system that's counteracting that, that is a quick way to stifle someone's potential. And so I, that's something that still persists today that I think is another contributing factor to the lack of diversity in medicine. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the possibilities. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> in uh, uh, my research in regard to uh, women breaking barriers, um, one thing that I did notice is that there's usually a time when white male to come up to you um, in college and say, why are you here? When the man could use the education that you're getting, can you describe any situation like that that you had? Yeah, I think there's definitely this persistent message that certain people belong and are owed to have spots in this space and others don't necessarily deserve it. There have been, at my school and other medical schools, instances where Black students were told that we're taking the spots from more deserving applicants. No insight into what our application is. Um, but just this assumption that we're not good enough and we're only here. By definition. Yeah, to fill this quota. Um, and that was something that some of the women experienced as well. Dr. Claudia Thomas, she was in medical school, I think in the 1970s. She went to Hopkins. <laughs> she went on to become the first black female orthopedic surgeon. Um, she went to Yale for a residency and then went back to Hopkins for as a faculty member. And then she described an instance where one of the white male faculty that was there when she was a medical student went up to her and told her that he felt like she had just gotten into Hopkins Medical School because of affirmative action and he had voted against her. Um, implying that she didn't deserve it, wasn't up to the par. Yet, she not only completed Hopkins, she got into an extremely competitive specialty as the first Black woman to do so, and then Hopkins deemed her competitive enough to then go back and hire her as a faculty member. But still, this man felt entitled to make her feel like she didn't belong, even at that stage. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, those are messages that I think continues to happen either from the perspective of gender or the perspective of race or both. Um, and I think when there is not the counteracting, like support system, that was the big thing that I saw in my book for all of these women, like they had a really strong support system that helped to get them through. And one of the limiting factors in my research was that I was only studying black women who had made it. So I wasn't seeing <clears throat> For the black women who had the potential, who were trying, but then didn't end up making it to the end, what was the thing that went wrong? But from seeing how strong of a support system these women have, and knowing like within my own life, having friends who I felt like had so much potential, were intelligent, but they didn't have as much support system as, as I had growing up, 
that have led them on a different path. And so I do think that's a key factor when you're having people that are trying to make you feel like you're not good enough or you don't belong, like meeting people who are encouraging you and lifting you up. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am not your soul, <laughs> but I am your sister. <laughs> so y'all know what that written white means, but that's what I do. I, I have doubts in the book too. Oh, that's a beautiful thing. <laughs> it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't intentional. It was just a moment that I felt. Well, you know, we are all everywhere. And I'm just so proud to be part of the sisterhood of Black women doing the darn thing. Um, here's my concern and my question. I'm a mental health profession. And my concern is African Americans are beginning to understand the power of therapy. How do I work with psychiatrists and I'm looking to work with the, a larger group of African Americans so that they can begin to understand, uh, have a little talk with Jesus is good, but having a little talk with therapy is even better. <laughs> yeah, there's so much like taboo, I think within the black community mm -hmm. of caring for your mental health. Um, I think we are taught we're supposed to be strong and being strong means dealing with all of the challenge that we face in our life along not seeking help um, but I definitely agree with the importance of going to therapies like just making sure that you're caring for your mental health as much as you're caring for the rest of your body and particularly within black communities where we have so many like factors that is traumatic one of my classmates us in medicine he told me about instances where he's at school. That's everything all the medical students are doing in terms of our long class schedule. Mm -hmm. Then he's like walking home and starts getting like profiled by the police and like they're intimidating him. Mm -hmm. And just the mental burden that comes with that constant dehumanization being viewed as a threat and how you manage that with the rest of the burdens that just you have in your life, like life can be hard for anyone. And so then having those additional factors, like I, I'm not really sure how, I think just continued conversations, like that's something that I talk about with my friends and, and people that I care about, the importance of seeking help, like when you need it and that there's not shame in that. It's, it's empowering it's really important um, and it helps us to be well overall um, but I think yeah maybe just continuing to have those conversations within our community and reinforce like trying to reduce the stigma I guess of seeking mental uh, health services one of the barriers in the business mm. is the licensing process mm. and it happens over and over so African Americans in the field who want to do independent work their own practices no one or many of us did not have an opportunity to get the license mm. under someone because most of the people doing it are people of not of color mm -hmm. and they're not giving us the opportunity so we're up against that same battle yeah. and it becomes very difficult to treat our own yeah thank you so much for your time thank you hi beautiful hi. <laughs> um so um i obviously we're sisters and, you know, just seeing your journey has been so incredible. So I'm very, very proud of you. Um, I think a question that I have is, um, as I am seeing more young black women, um, as they're starting to pursue medicine, um, I don't think a lot of people talk about the barriers that they still face today, mm -hmm. right? Um, you talked about the barriers that they faced um, in your research. Um, but I think even getting into medical schools mm. is very, very hard. Um, can you talk about any research that you may have come across in even getting into medical school, how that was hard for those women? Um, and have you seen any parallels in that research to your own journey yeah. getting into medical school? Um, and then if you have any like thoughts about how medical schools could be more or what changes could be made to break down those barriers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so something that was, I guess, like the parallel of like my own journey and then learning about the history of it, one thing that I saw was how expensive it is mm -hmm. to get into medical school, to s continue the training. Just now, like a, a week ago, having to pay for 
um, to register for step one, which is one of the medical license exams. It's like six hundred dollars just to register. Um, and so experiencing that through like as I was going through the application process while I was at Oxford, while researching it, it was really enlightening. So in the 1800s, medicine didn't have the same prestige associated with it that it has now. I saw one article where someone wrote that men go into medicine because they're not smart enough to get into law school. <laughs> and that was really funny to me. I'm like, wow, this is different than, <laughs> than how things are now. Um, but at the turn of the 20th century, there was this increasing effort to raise the status of medicine. And that like went along with the Flexen Report. And part of one of their strategies for making it more elite was elitism and who gets in. So at that point, there were more women entering, there were more people of color entering, there were people with a broader spectrum of socioeconomic status entering medicine. But the practicing physicians felt that this impacted their status. So with the Flexen Report, some of the changes that were implemented made it very difficult for people who were not high income like didn't come from high income earning families to enter medicine. So one example was um, increasing the education level requirement where you had to have a certain number of years in college to be to apply for medical school at a time when only like 2% of all American citizens went to college. Mm -hmm. um, and those financial barriers, the lengthening of medical school, which then means more years that you're paying for tuition, that increasing the barrier to entry. And then I also found that it was very nepotistic during that like 1800s, 1900s for Dr. Fairby. When she came to DC, she initially was trying to get into like a, a government hospital. So she had to do written exam and then an oral exam. They grade on her written exam. On the oral exam, she's among a committee of white men, my, white male physicians. And they're even telling her, like, we don't want to give you this spot because we're trying to save this for our sons. Mm -hmm. um, and so just that normalization of this is a family business, basically, mm -hmm. and we're keeping it within the family and excluding others has persisted. I think it's it's much less common now, but still... Depending on the specialty, I've heard it's it's similar. And then even if you look at the stats, at my school, the vast majority of the students at my school, either a parent or, fam or like a sibling, is a doctor. Mm -hmm. And my learning team, which is a group of six students who are randomly, I think randomly assigned, I'm the only person in my entire learning team who doesn't have a parent or a sibling who's in medicine. And so then with that, then you also pass down the knowledge, something des described as a hidden curriculum, a lot of unspoken rules that are come with how to succeed within medicine, how to decide, let's say for some of the competitive specialties that you really should know your first year or second year coming in that you want to go into let's say neurosurgery or orthopedics, because then you're expected to build this research repertoire, all these publications so that you're competitive by the time you're applying. But people are not in the hospital exploring these different fields until their third year. Mm -hmm. So for people who don't have that familial knowledge or it could be like friends as well, support from telling them what you need to do, but oftentimes that familial knowledge on what you need to do to succeed, then that stratifies who gets into medical school and then if you get into medical school what specialties are you able to get into the higher earning or the lower earning ones even though they're all, all like relatively high but mm -hmm. still even that stratification um so i definitely still see that um income barrier being a huge factor um and then that the hidden rules that come with succeeding that then when it's perpetuated of who is a family member, 
who is high earning that then throughout these past few generations are able to enter medicine, then they're able to support their kids more mm -hmm. in, in this field. Um, and then like just the knowledge on what you need to do to succeed. So it is definitely still, there's lots of barriers, gender, race, socioeconomic. more privileged like, backgrounds. What are some ways you think schools can help change that experience? I think the first thing is it exists. Because I think that, I don't think it's really recognized enough. It's kind of a secret because medicine, like, how smart we are and all this stuff. So then this idea of it's just merit, but not acknowledging the huge community-based support that goes into how each individual is able to succeed in medicine and then being more critical on those barriers like why does it cost thousands of dollars to apply to a number of medical schools that would give you a good chance of getting in why do you have to pay especially pre-covid but now it's like starting to go back to it why do you have to pay for each visit if you don't have five, ten thousand dollars saved up, then you can't go to those interviews. Mm -hmm. And even if like it's understandable that it's expensive to fly out all these students, but at least finding alternatives so that if someone has the financial barriers, they can still have a like more equal chance yeah. of putting themselves forward. Like why is step one so expensive? Why is step two so expensive? Why is it that if you don't have significant financial aid, someone can have essentially $500,000 in debt after they leave medical school when you include interest. Yeah, it's crazy. Like when I <laughs> when I heard this, like from, thankfully I had, I was blessed with a scholarship because when I was hearing about this back in an undergrad, like in my last year preparing to apply, I was like, do I really want to do this? Because that number, that's heavy. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so... I think that that step of like acknowledging that it's a problem and trying to think of those like targeted ways to to start to make things better. Thank you. I think this is outstanding. And uh, <clears throat> I went to a school. I can't remember whether there were any blacks at all in my class. Um, and it wasn't until I got out and had met somebody who went to Crossroads, Operation Crossroads Africa, mm. just turned me around. Mm. You know, we were in the minority. We, we uh, And it was wonderful to see that and to see what wonderful students we were working with. Mm. Anyway, it's it, it changed my life, I think, more than almost anything else I've done. But I also saw recently um, on Howard University's TV station, the uh, AKA presentation. Mm. Did you see that? Which presentation? It, it's on the sorority. It's, it was wonderful. And it seems to me uh -oh. that such a resource, and it's obviously not well-known resource, mm -hmm. um, you would know of the sorority, but um, what they're doing and that they put out an actual, you know, hour and a half on the sorority uh, and oh, what yeah. they're doing. Um, I'm just wondering if you think there's any way that that kind of resource, that kind of um, presentation could get into wider view. It would certainly be helpful, yeah. <clears throat> even for people you know, like me who are, you know, enthusiastic to find out more. Mm -hmm. It's still, there's not a lot of good information yeah. out there. Yeah, I think the history, so I feel like I was able to see that at an event um so i'm not sure how it was accessed publicly but i thought they said it was i don't know if they said it was on like netflix or like somewhere what was it oh okay it was on amazon so yeah i think maybe one of the bears is like knowing that it exists um knowing that you can like where to look for it um but i guess for that it's just like 
word of mouth um, is the best thing that I can think of of trying to spread the word that there are these organizations that are really invested in supporting Black communities and to learn more about what they're doing and, and where to find out about it. But yeah, I agree. It's incredible all the things that Alpha Kappa Alpha and all the other Divine Nine organizations have done um, to support the Black community. Yeah, it's, it's frustrating that it's not well known. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Jasmine. Hi. Um, well, first of all, it's amazing to see you at your book event uh, when I sat next to you in the library when this was just your dissertation. So I'm very proud. Um, my question's about so a lot of people that I know in medicine talk a lot about how, from the patient perspective, race plays a role in, excuse me, because I don't have a better, <laughs> better way to word this, but like accuracy of diagnosis mm -hmm. or being able to catch something when something's going on with the patient. Mm -hmm. Like a stat that I've heard a lot about is, for example, like African-American mothers lose their babies a lot more than white mothers do. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in... First, like if you heard about that from any of the women you talked to, like who were doctors, yeah. you know, in the last hundred years, and then also how you think it plays a role today and how it might change. Yeah, I'm definitely aware of it. Like I, that's something, a fear that I have as a black woman who wants to have kids. And, and I learned about in, in med school that even when matched for education level and income, black women still have higher mortality rates. Uh, maternal mortality rates and so when I was learning that I was the only black woman in the room and I'm looking around I'm like so I'm going to become a doctor and I'm still more at risk than my classmates um, one of the women in the book Dr. Edith Irby Jones she was the first black person to desegregate a medical school in the south this was a few years before, this is like the late 1940s, so a little bit before the Brown versus Board of Ed case, which required desegregation of schools. And so she went through that process. She was at University of Arkansas where she wasn't allowed to eat in the dining hall with her classmates because of not allowing racial mixing. She wasn't allowed to use the women's bathroom because her white, like, female classmates used the same bathroom. And then she went to residency, and she got pregnant. And so she made all these arrangements to give birth at the hospital that she had been working at. And after, like, learning, like, as I continue on in my, like, medical journey, just learning about the crazy schedule that residents have to work, um realizing like she was putting in a lot of work at this hospital but still there was like some type of mix-up and so she wasn't she was going into labor and for some reason like they didn't have a bed for her or something so she wasn't able to give birth at the hospital so the ho the ob obstetrician that she had um her obstetrician who was like scheduled to deliver her baby he told her let's just go to the hospital across the street. And she was initially like, well, how are we going to do that? Like that hospital does not admit black patients. And he's like, look, you're literally delivering, like you're in labor right now. Like let's go to across the street. She ended up having complications during her um, delivery and had to get a C-section. But because this hospital still practiced like racial segregation in hospitals, they refused to admit her afterwards. So they did this huge surgery, open abdomen surgery, and then told her she couldn't stay in the hospital overnight because she was black. So she had to go home. She taught her husband, who was not a physician, how to circumcise their son in their kitchen. Um, and as someone like, as I'm learning more about surgery, like how important it is for someone to be in a hospital for more intensive surgery like that, at least for like a day or two to make sure they're stabilized. Like they, this surgeons sent her home knowing that they did this invasive surgery and just left for her to deal with it on her own. Thankfully, like she survived, like there wasn't like a, something really bad that happened when she went home. Um, and for that hospital, that was like a very, 
like radical like the the physician i think was a white man like he was like very upset about it and then end up like somehow getting the hospital closed or something like it was like a huge response into because she was the first black person to desegregate a medical school in the south like there was a lot of eyes on her and then a lot of eyes on her as she was about to deliver her baby knowing like what happens when a black mom is, is about to give birth in this in the jim crow south in the segregated space um so that was like a victory story in my mind like wow they actually responded to this but a lot of times there's not that level of response um and so there are those types of injustices that happen and and they're maybe more swept under the rug yeah so reading that was like i kind of uh, write about a little bit of like how it's really scary to to hear even that of like she was a whole resident at this hospital and still she ended up having this bad treatment when she was in this very vulnerable position and my fear when i prayerfully am able to like have kids um like my plan is like i have i'm gonna be a doctor i'm gonna have close friends who are doctors like they're gonna be either in the delivery room with me <laughs> or very close by to make sure that when i'm not as like there's a lot that goes on maybe i might like need medication that makes me like more like less sharp minded and i'll need people to like back me up that understand what's going on but it's like a really sad thing to even feel like i need that and knowing that most people don't have that mm -hmm. um like i will say like i was from hearing all these things like i heard about it before i came in, into medical school and that was kind of my plan like i need doctors who are like my really close friends who will make sure they're there for me at this period like is there like, am I going to, when I do my rotation, my ob rotation, going to show up and see, like, this very um, explicit injustices happening for Black patients? I was grateful that when I was there um, during my ob rotation, like, I didn't really see that explicitly. Um, I think a lot of doctors, regardless of race, like, they care about their patients and they want um, them to be well. But there's still like a lot of things ingrained within the system that like contributes to these poor outcomes. Like some of well-known ones, for instance, in nephrology, so like kidney doctors is, I think some places are starting to overturn this, but for a long time and still in a lot of hospitals and um, calculating their kidney function, there's a tabulation for race. And it's not like the act, doctors ask each patient, like, what is your ancestral history? Like, who is your grand, who is your mother? Who is your grandmother? Like, where do they come from? It's like they look at you and say, you look black, you look white, whatever. When for blackness, that's a large spectrum. Like, if somebody is mixed, is, are they more white or are they more black? Like, are we using the one drop rule? Um, <laughs> with this idea of like we're scientific in medicine but then we're using these socially constructed um like ideas and not even asking the patient like how they identify or what is their history we're just making assumptions mm -hmm. but then within that calculation of kidney function for black patients there's like a higher marker in order to like send red flags of like their kidneys there's something wrong mm -hmm. it is like rooted what I've heard, it's like ruin this idea that like black people are more muscular, so then they have more proteins and that affects this kidney function marker, which is just like, just like with Abraham Flexner, who this man was not even a physician, but was given all this power on, on medical education. But it's like, we all come in with our biases. And then when it is ingrained in policy and medical practice, then it's like people forget that we come in with that perspective of this subjectiveness and say this is objective and so then as a medical student i'm taught these the way you do medicine the way you do clinical practice like i'm regularly taught this like okay is the patient black or not let's put this in the file but not how am i even attaining like how am i even figuring out if they're black or not or why am i doing this mm -hmm. but just follow what your residence says follow what your doc like your attending says they have more insight, just do this thing. And then it's like passed on generation after generation. And so for the kidney um, situation, 
black patients with kidney like chronic kidney failure harder for them to get a kidney transplant because of these like systematic ways of like how clinical is like how medicine is practiced so they're more likely to go on dialysis dialysis has poor outcomes than kidney transplants so then that means that black patients with kidney failure die at higher rates because of in part because of this way that medicine is practiced Mm -hmm. um and so i think like that's as I've been trying to understand why are these these significant health disparities within medicine and, and so many specialties within ob within nephrology, within ophthalmology. So like eye doctors, like black patients are significantly more likely to have glaucoma and go blind from glaucoma, which is a preventable cause of blindness. Mm-hmm. Like you literally just give them eye drops, but people are going blind that then shortens their lifespan and like significantly impacts their quality of life, et cetera. Um, so yeah, so like, I think it, it's really difficult and complicated because of like the way medicine is, is taught where like as a medical trainee, we just, for the most part, take on what people tell us and it's hard to really scythe through where did this come from? Because mm-hmm. we're really like overloaded with information and then we just carry it and throughout practice. Um, so I think that's something I like have to think about more when I like, like I, like all of the black doctors, like everybody becomes a patient at some point. Mm-hmm. And so, um, even with, if I'm just thinking about my own health, what am I going to do to make sure that when I'm a patient, I don't become a victim of this system? Um, trying to understand like, what are the structures that are impacting, um, these poor outcomes because I I do have more faith in doctors now than I did before from seeing like so many physicians from like so many backgrounds who care a lot about their patients regardless of of the patient's background yeah but it's it's really hard um well hopefully you're going to be in a position of power so you can be part of the change too yeah thanks Jasmine all right let's give our author a round of applause So we have plenty of books at the registers. We are going to have a signing right up here at this wooden table. If you'd like to um, line up at the podium to get your book signed, uh, it can start now. And thank you all for coming. We also ask that you fold up your chair before you go.